What we're going to talk about today is what your eye doctor may miss when you go to the eye exam. You guys know they look inside your pupil right here with a bright light. And when they look in the back, they're going to see your blood vessels. But the problem with looking in it, that flashlight that we use and we get really close to your face, we only see probably from about here to about there. And the new technology today allows a laser beam to go through and take a photo all the way out to here. This is the company that I had in my private practice back as early as 1998. But back then, this device couldn't sit on top of a desktop like you see here. This device took up the size of a closet. Technology has obviously improved. And I felt when I was in private practice that it was well worth the investment as an eye doctor that I had every one of my patients during a routine eye exam have a photo of the back wall of the eye. The photo that you're going to see today is from Ruben, one of my clients who had an eye exam this year and actually had an eye exam in the previous year. And he has photos that we're going to use to show what his eye doctor missed. You'll ask, well, how do I know if I've had this done or not? You may not know because most eye exams, different types of tests usually run this similar fashion where it's some sort of desktop thing and you put your forehead forward and you look into a peephole and something happens in there. Now, I do know that you guys all remember the puff of air because nobody likes getting that done. When it comes to a retinal photo, this can be confused with a lot of other tests that you guys may have. The reason it might be confusing is because when you see your doctor in the exam room, these tests are not done by the doctor. They are done by a technician. So by the time you see the doctor, if he or she does not want to spend the time going over your results, you may never know if you had a photo or not, unless, of course, something bad shows up. Then they may take a step aside and say, you know, Mr. Jones, here's what we found looking in your eye. Now we're going to have to refer you for blah, 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 or we're going to have to do this next type of testing. The inside of the eye, looking in through this pupil, whether it be with an old-fashioned ophthalmoscope, which is an expensive flashlight to look in the eye, or a digital image, Either way, it's the only way we doctors can look into the body and see what your vascular system is doing. Meaning, how are your blood vessels looking without cutting you open? This is why people should have an eye exam every year. Regardless of the vision stuff, I believe that an exam is necessary every year for your cardiovascular system. Here we have Ruben as a client of mine who came in to help get rid of belly fat and reverse disease. But then he says, hey, since you were an eye doctor and I had this eye exam, can you take a look at my eye photos? So Ruben, head and tell me what your doctor told you about the back wall of your eye. So basically they said everything looks good. There were two main things that I remember him pointing out. And one of them had like little stars and then the other one, like a little foggy stuff. But he said everything looks good. It was real quick, like 15 seconds. So 15 seconds he spent on that and that was it. Did he tell you what to do about it? No. <laughs> oh. No, no he, you know, he said there, was, uh, there wasn't anything there indicating uh, glaucoma or I forget what other thing. But, uh, or I guess uh, retinal separation, I guess. Since everything looked good, that was, there was nothing really to, to go over. He, had, he asked me if I had any questions, but I'm not the eye doctor, so I didn't know. <laughs> Very good, Ruben. You've given me the exact reason why I'm doing this webinar as a public service announcement. And I'm going to teach you guys here in this webinar what to look for on your own photos, because obviously the doctor didn't go to the next level that he should have for the whole purpose of what I just told you guys earlier. Everyone should have a routine eye exam for the simple fact of looking at what's going on in the rest of the body, not just the eye. You see here, the red, we'll call that the artery. The blue, we'll call that the vein. Arteries and veins are being piped into the eye here. And I just told you, this is the only place in the body that we can actually examine what's going on with your body 
when it comes to your health because we don't have to cut you open and make you bleed. It's very simple, it's very painless, and it didn't take more than a quarter of a second for that photo to be taken by this device here, or you know, there's other devices, not just Optos. I just happen to like the brand because they were really great with my private practice. But here's the key. If the doctor takes the photos and then doesn't interpret them to the level that I'm gonna teach you today, it's because the doctor is part of what we call the siloed model of the American Medical Society. That is, his doctor, Ruben's doctor, specifically said, you don't have glaucoma. Well, glaucoma has to do with increased pressure in this area. And he said, you don't have retinal separation. So that's good. That means that this back wall of the eye is not separating from itself, which would be a retinal detachment. So the good news is at least the doctor took care of what was going on visually. But this is where an eye doctor should have been trained to also tell a patient if they have the possibility of any cardiovascular disease. This is a picture of the back wall of Ruben's eye. We're taking a photo coming in through the pupil and we're taking a photo of this. So this is the picture of that. And let me point out this here, the yellow tube that you see in the back is actually part of your brain. And the way we as eye doctors to see how your brain is doing, we look at the donut that it makes when it enters the eye. That donut, what we're looking at is to see if there's any inflammation going on in the brain, but also if there's any pressure that's too high on the inside of the eye, compressing it, which can cause parts of the brain tissue to die. So when he said, you don't have glaucoma, good. Brain tissue looks good back there. But here is the dilemma. He told you, you had some stars and some foggy area. These are what he's talking about. You see this up here, this little white patch? Yeah. The problem I have with him saying that things look good is that he should have said things look good when it comes to your vision, but not so good when it comes to your cardiovascular system. Meaning you have a lack of blood flow back here. That's why it's a patchy white color. You might even see a little bit of patchiness up right here and here. These are areas that show that your blood vessel supply to the back wall of the eye is not as proficient as it should be. But fortunately for you, you're in this program where you're learning how to eat, what to eat, and when to eat, and also the things that you can do to move levers in your body to help you so that we can reverse this problem. Usually, these problems that you have here can be reversed within a three-month period. So if we had the luxury of having photos done every three months, but I'm not gonna ask you to do that because we use other measures. We ask you to measure your belly at the belly button area. We ask you to measure your neck and that's what we follow on a monthly basis. As we're getting those to decrease, we're gonna help the profusion of blood to this area here and to this area here so that you don't lose any valuable real estate when it comes to the back wall of the eye because the back wall of the eye is what you see with but here's what i want to show you when it comes to the beautiful part of the human body the part that's more important to you guys is your vision and that part is just this area right here because when it comes to your vision all you care about is what you guys see straight ahead you guys really don't know when there's a problem way out here because if i were to draw a line of vision let's say the light comes through into the eye and it hits the back wall of the eye over here. And let's say there's a problem up here, which by the way, you see Ruben right up there. There's where the problem is. So let's say the vision attached to that area, you would never notice a problem visually because you have a second eyeball. That second eyeball more than likely will not have a concurrent problem in the same area that you would not see. Somebody was really thinking good when they made our human body and gave us two eyes. That way, if one falters, you have the other one to take over. So this is why we can't wait for you to have symptoms of vision problems before we step in to do something. I found out that they have Ruben's date of birth incorrect. 
and they've had it incorrect for the last two years. So see date of birth up here, 1950, April 23rd. Ruben, can you confirm yes or no? Is that your date of birth? It is not by 15 years. <laughs> exactly. Okay. <laughs> by 15 years. Now herein lies the problem, guys. Number one, I'm the data queen. This is why when you guys come into the program, I'm always asking for your labs and I'm asking for any testing that a doctor has done because the simplest of mistakes like date of birth creates the question of, are we even looking at what happened with Ruben's eyes on that day? So this is where I want you guys to understand. There's mistakes in the medical industry. And just so you know, for the United States, that 250,000 Americans die from medical mistakes every year. How many do you think die from driving a car in America? Ruben, what would you say? Per year, I'd say 50,000. You guess. are almost there. 47,000 people die. So compare 47,000 people dying each year from driving in a car versus going to a doctor. 250,000. That's a quarter of a million people. So this tells you guys that you have a better, safer chance of driving your car and staying alive than you do when it comes to going to a doctor. Mm -hmm. And this kind of data error on his date of birth is part of the problem. And I'll admit, it's not the doctor who made this error. It was a staff member because we doctors, when we see patients, we don't put this information in. We have it set up through the process of when you come through the office, you, they go over your file. They should be confirming date of birth. I do want to show you guys something about the human body that's impressive. I've already said that the center of your eye is the part that you guys care about. Well, here's the part that you care about right here. This is the part that Ruben sees with. If something happens here, Ruben's going to know there's a problem there because it's hard to miss if you close one eye and you look at a piece of paper, you'll be able to see if this area here is healthy or not. You don't have the ability to go get an eye exam. The least that you can do is cover one eye, take a piece of paper and put it in front of you and look and look right in the center. And if you see any waviness, you see any streaks, you see any spots, you need to get to the eye doctor fast because this part of the eye is the most critical part. But the human body was set up in such a way that when you guys mess up, when it comes to how you eat, when you eat, what you eat, how you live a lifestyle, it's not going to happen right here in the middle of the eye. It's going to happen in the periphery out here before it ever gets down below here in the infinite wisdom of the human body in a way you're protected but you're only protected if you go to an eye doctor who lets you know hey there are some problems out here Ruben we got to work on so that you don't have a heart attack and why did I say heart attack because if the blood vessels are not getting blood to the back wall of the eye out here the eyeball is such a small organ compared to the heart, which means if we have problems in the eye, it's the canary in the coal mine. It's letting us know that in the future, Reuben is going to have heart disease. But the good news is Reuben's in the program. He's learning how to eat, when to eat, and what to eat. And he even said during our conversation, he goes, now I'm really scared because my vision is the most important to me. And sometimes we need that kind of scare to get on board with what we're supposed to be doing because here's what happens. Life can get in the way. Sometimes we're too busy. We've got other things going on in our life and we put our health on hold while we take care of A, B, C, and D. When in reality, your body's saying, we're gonna keep things at bay for as long as we can so that you don't lose central vision. But this right out here, when his doctor said, see you next year, but in a few years, if he doesn't fix things, it will become a retinal detachment. And that's when the eye doctor will step in. And this is what's wrong about siloed medicine. An eye doctor is only handling the eye. The eye doctor should say, 
I'm not seeing any eye problem, but we need to get you on board for your cardiovascular system. See how far it is from the center of your eye, Reuben? This is what gives us time to prevent you to have vision loss. On this one, this is the left eye. There is what is the problem right here. And I'm going to make it even bigger. It's called crossing defect, artery vein nicking. Do you see how it looks like a little sausage? Ruben, are you able to see that on your screen? Yeah, it clearly looks like it one stomped on the other and blocked it off. Like sausage links, you know how they twist them at each end to or, separate them? That's great for sausages, but not great <laughs> for the vascular system. This is actually an artery right here. The darker, thicker one is the vein coming underneath. What you see on this, to be more specific, is that you also have what we call copper wire effect, where you got that sheen. Can you see, Ruben, the little shininess that runs along that artery? Yes, and more so down at the bottom left area there. Here's the other thing you can see. Do you see the difference in color right here? On the artery, you see a little spot right there? Yes. That's going to be eventually what we call beading. When things get worse, it'll actually start to look like a pearl necklace. And in defense of his doctor, maybe his doctor saw this, but maybe his doctor doesn't care about vascular disease. Why? I don't know. Maybe we need to find out the school he went to and find out why he ignored this. But I had a patient in my private practice who had this exact same problem. And he was in his late 40s at the time when he came in. He looked healthy. He looked normal. But when I saw him, I said, you have a problem on the back of the eye called a crossing defect. I'm going to refer you to a cardiologist. The process would have been to go to a cardiologist because this is an indication of vascular disease and we want to make sure that there's no heart problem. Well, this patient, he never made it to that appointment. He ignored it. Instead, he ended up having a heart attack within one year of that visit. But fortunately, his son was with him when he had it, so they were able to call 911. Reuben, if we say, are you a ticking time bomb for a heart attack? Here's what may happen. Under times of stress, with blood vessel crossing defects, could it create a heart attack? It's the stress that I'm concerned about. So what do we tell you to do to decrease stress? Exactly what this patient was doing. He was out walking, but he had a heart attack while he was out walking. So do you see the, the issues that we run into here? You need to make sure that you're, number one, getting enough sleep. Number two, if you exercise, you need to make sure you're doing it in a safe place and you're not overheating yourself. I'm from an area in the desert where I'm thinking that this man was out walking in the heat and he shouldn't have been because if you get overheated, then there can be a problem. The good news is that Ruben, you now know I need to get on track here. And what we're going to do is have you have these photos retaken in three months. I don't want you to have to pay out of pocket for this and nor should you because remember, what are we doing? We're confirming that date of birth. Is this really your eye or not? Do you see the arrows not very far from the macular area, right? That last time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, you already got it. You already got what I was trying to tell you. So this is not going to happen tomorrow, but this is something we certainly need to be aware of that we're working towards fixing. I'm hyper-focused on this area so I can teach you guys what it is that's important. The artery that you have here has what we would consider like a slimy inner liner wall so that everything can slip on through. But when we have too much inflammation in our bodies, that slippery liner starts to get calcified. That's a little cartoon drawing of the artery having calcification start to develop in here. So why does the calcification begin to develop in here? It's your body's protective mechanism when inflammation has gone on too long. 
So think of inflammation as a fire going on in the body and your body wants to put the fire out. But sometimes that fire lasts way too long, meaning the fire just keeps on burning and burning in your body and it's starting to create damage to the inside wall of the artery. So the body says in its infinite wisdom, well, we better shore up these blood vessels so that this blood vessel doesn't burst. Because what happens, Ruben, if that blood vessel were to burst? Not good things. <laughs> okay. It would create a hemorrhage. Blood right. would be spewing through there. And if that blood happens to spew out and get to a level where it goes to the center of your vision, now you would notice a problem. But in God's infinite wisdom or whoever the aliens were that created this wonderful piece of equipment we call the human body, it's more than likely not going to happen because all of the calcification is strengthening up that artery wall. But in defense of the body, it's a good thing for arteries, but not for the little vein that's underneath, right? Because it's pinching the vein off. The body is trying to help you stay alive until you can figure out how to reverse the problem. Because what do we teach here? We help you to get out of your own way decrease inflammation so that this calcium won't continue to build up. It is also possible for your body to get rid of this calcium, but it's probably not going to get rid of it early on. It's going to spend more time helping these little white patches that he has over here. The body's smart. It's going to say, nope, we need to get more blood flow over here before we start changing this inner wall, we're going to put more blood flow to these areas because your body's smart in knowing to do what's best for your survival so that you guys have an understanding of what is the most important part of our human body. It is the endothelial layer. Most doctors do not understand this. So this is why I teach it to you guys as clients or those of you that are listening to this as a public service announcement. Inside of every artery, there's a single layer of cells. This single layer of cells is called the endothelial layer. This is the layer that's supposed to be letting things pass through without getting stuck. But what ends up happening when we have inflammation? We get kinks in the armor here. Once some of these cells start to pop open, it will allow the body to say, we've got problems. And let's shore it up. And that here comes the cholesterol, it's like spackle. It's to shore up the breaks in the artery wall. When that happens, remember, it's because your body knows that these cells need to stay intact. And if they don't, it's going to put cholesterol inside to fix it. Cholesterol is not the bad guy. It shows up to help you, not to hurt you. And that were to split and the blood were to come out, hemorrhage, bleeding in the eye, not good for your vision. But what we need to do is to help this endothelial layer to be healthy again. And this endothelial layer is not just in the eyes. Every artery, capillary, vein, venule has this endothelial layer. And you currently have 60,000 miles end to end if they were to put them together in your own body right now of blood vessels. 60,000 miles means two times around the earth is currently in your body right now. And this is important for you guys to understand when it's so much real estate inside of your blood vessels. This is key to why the whole program that I teach you guys in the eight week course is to teach you guys how to get this endothelial layer in working order. That's the whole program. Now, granted, if I were to go out on the internet and try to sell a program and say, hey, fix your endothelial layer. People are like, what, who cares? Well, this is why I'm, I care, but I have to teach it to you in a way where you guys come in because you guys wanna get rid of belly fat, you guys wanna reverse high blood pressure, you guys want to reverse diabetes. All of these things that I'm mentioning are because the endothelial layer was compromised. 
every disease you throw at me, I can tell you it has something to do with the endothelial layer, which is why when you come into this program, we're not just about getting rid of belly fat. We're about reversing 85% of health problems. Now, the 15% of health problems that we don't touch, well, this is where we need emergency medical. You break your arm, you fall and you hit your head, you need to get your head sewn back together. All of that, we love medicine for. But 85% of what goes wrong with the human body, it's our own fault, but we can also fix it ourselves. Ruben showed up at his eye doctor with this, and his doctor said, see you next year. This doctor is either blind or stupid because this is what it looks like when you have high blood pressure that's malignant. Now, most people with a malignant form of high blood pressure means it's been going on way too long and not well controlled, and it's gone way too high. This is what a hemorrhage looks like right here. This, Reuben, is what it looks like when you let things go for way too long. But guess mm -hmm. what? It takes years for uh, the body to let it happen this bad. If Ruben's doctor let the crossing defect that we saw go, he's not going to miss this. But this is what we're about here in this program. We don't want to wait until you look like this for your doctor to get moving on referring you to a doctor for the next step. Let's move on to this one. This is a person who has diabetes so bad they've ignored it for decade after decade. They haven't been doing what they should be doing. So now they have more hemorrhages and these exudates. Some of you have texted me or emailed me and say, I have drusen or I have hard exudates or soft exudates. That's all of the stuff that you see here. And I don't care what a doctor calls it. And you don't need to care either. All you need to know is is that this is when the endothelial layer has broken down so bad that parts of the blood supply are leaking into the retina, the back wall of the eye. The endothelial layer breaks down. Sometimes you get parts of the blood here that are not colored red, and then other times you get the whole part of the blood, which is red. So let me move on to the time factor. Ruben's eye. The nicking that he has here, technically, he could have a year or 10 years. We don't know. It depends on what's going on in the heart. I can only make an assumption that what I see in the eye is representative of what's going on in the heart. But like I said before, the canary in the coal mine is the eye that's going to happen before the heart. For any of you guys that have eye photos to share, you're welcome to go ahead and send them to me if you're my client and I'll review them. If you're not my client, you can go ahead and email me and I'll send you a calendar link so that you can talk about what your problems are and we can see whether or not you can be helped because that's one of the reasons I make appointments because I need to know where you are in your journey and whether or not I can help you in that. Because it's my responsibility to also make sure that if you talk to me about your problems, that you don't have a serious impending problem that needs to be handled right away. And that's just to cover me legally and to make sure you get what you need at the time you need it. Back to reminding you guys, your body has an infinite wisdom that we're tapping into. We're not telling the body what to do. The body knows what to do. We're telling you guys to get out of your own way. It takes time for the body to make a decision in hierarchy of how do we keep you alive longer, healthier, and happier. And at this point, that AV nicking may be last on the list because you've got other problems that need fixing. And the body's going to send its energy and its immune system to handle those first. Would you recommend aspirin therapy just in case, you know? If you would have asked me this five years ago, I would have said yes to the aspirin. But here we are in 2024, and it's been well-documented research that was done that shows that aspirin ruins that endothelial lining. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So let's take it a step further, though. I don't want you to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think you might have heard me talk about this before with Ron, because remember, Ron suffered a D 
deep vein thrombosis while on an airplane. Can you just tell everybody what happened with that deep vein thrombosis? Sure. I, I was fine throughout the flight. Didn't notice anything. I got off the plane and I went to a meeting. I, I felt this pain in my right leg during the meeting while I was sitting there. I went to the restroom and pulled up my pant leg and saw a red line coming up from my foot going up to my groin. And then I realized, okay, something's wrong here. I called my wife and she wisely told me, get to the hospital now. And so I did. And they immediately admitted me and they watched me for a day or two. They didn't know if I had a clot that was going to dislodge and go to the heart. Thank you, Ron, for sharing that experience. And hopefully this guy gives you a tip here. He was flying in an airplane. When you go to a different altitude, actually, Ron, how long was that flight? Three to five hours. I didn't notice the problem when I was flying. I noticed the problem when I got off and started walking. And actually, I have this video on my YouTube channel about DVT that you guys can look at. I explained that if the flight is three hours or longer, you should consider taking aspirin for preventative maintenance, meaning thinning your blood. Even though I know it damages the endothelial liner, but that's if you're going to take it every day. Because guys, remember, I'm 60 years old. So I remember bear aspirin commercials saying generally to everybody, we should be taking one baby aspirin a day for heart health. Okay. I don't believe in that. A lot of doctors used to believe in that. That's why they still prescribe it. But what you guys should know is you shouldn't be taking it every day. But if you're going to go on a flight, absolutely take the aspirin for preventative maintenance, especially if you're over the age of 50, especially like Ron, who has had a DVT already, because one aspirin is not going to hurt you. They've been trying to market this over-the-counter drug to you and sell more of it for more profits to their companies, paying the price with your human body. So aspirin's great to help you with a headache or thin your blood. You know what else thins your blood, guys? Vitamin E. How many of you have been to the dentist who ask you, are you taking vitamin E? Because they know once they start digging into your gums, and if you are taking vitamin E, you're going to bleed more and longer because of the thin blood. And vitamin E is something you can get from food. So Ruben, I would rather you just eat food that's high in vitamin E. Not to mention, guys, vitamin E is good for below the belt. Why? Because in order for your appendage below the belt to work, you have to have blood flow. You can't have blood flow if there's blockages or if the blood is too thick. Again, vitamin E helps. Suri, which foods are rich in vitamin E? Including nuts, oils, vegetables, and fruit. Some of the most common sources of vitamin E are almonds, sunflower seeds, canola oil, olive oil, margarine, eggs, dairy, leafy greens, and fortified cereals. I'm gonna throw out the margin. That came from the marketing agency who pays Google to throw in the margin because that's stupid. Nobody should be eating margin, guys. That is plastic in a cup. Do not eat margin. The other one that she said was fortified cereals. Guys, cereal is dessert. And the reason they fortify it is to make moms think they're doing something good for their kids. And that's BS. The others, I like the olive oil, but you shouldn't drink it. You should put that on your salad. I love the leafy greens. I like the eggs. I like uh, the nuts. Nuts are good as long as they're not covered with sugar or put in with dried fruit because dried fruit is nature's candy. You don't want to be doing that. Did they, all, did they say canola oil? Yeah, they said canola oil. <laughs> oh, guys, see, the guys in the program know no canola oil. That's an industrial oil. So you see how you have options for food. The deep vein thrombosis, the doctor advised me because uh, I had to get on a plane again right away to go back. And he advised me to walk frequently within the plane, go back to the back of the plane and do pumping exercises with my feet while I'm looking like I'm standing there waiting for the bathroom. Can I do that instead of taking an aspirin? That has worked on many flights since then, and even longer flights than that. I have it on YouTube because it goes over exactly what Ron was saying about the exercises that I give, because that's a mechanical way to keep your blood flowing. Remember, Ron didn't feel the problem 
until he started walking. And it was the pain. Pain is a way for your body to say, hey, we got a problem. Please look into it. And Ron did the right thing by going and saying, what the heck is going on with my leg? And thank God he was married because it's us women who care enough to force you guys to do things. Because when I was in private practice, men very rarely made their own appointments. It was always the wife that cared about them that made them show up. On that deep vein thrombosis, what is the notion of wearing compression socks for a long flight? It's a yes and no. Without knowing a person's history, just to go out and buy compression socks is not always a good idea because let's say the person is a diabetic, they don't have enough blood flow to the bottom of their feet, and they wear compression socks, they may end up after a six or eight hour flight, they're not getting enough blood flow. So they end up getting ulcers on their feet. If the person's not diabetic, doesn't have any breaks or on the skin, then possibly compression socks are a good idea. But if they buy the ones that are cheap, and that compression sock has a seam on it can create enough rubbing to make that person start an ulcer that they may not know about, which creates a whole nother problem because of the bacteria now into the body. The body's not created that way where we're supposed to compress and stay compressed. I don't see any reason for you to wear compression socks on a regular basis. You should put them on and then take them off. And I know that this sounds like a pain in the butt, but compression works to help the blood flow to go back up to the heart so that it can get more oxygen. But what ends up happening on a plane, because of the altitude, it's hard for that to go on. So yes, compression socks works, but you can't leave them on the whole flight. Take them on and off. It's like a pumping action, which goes back to what Ron said. The exercises that I gave to do are exactly that, to create the calf muscle, which is a pump, by the way. That's what the calf muscle is for, to pump the blood flow back up to the heart because the venous system doesn't have a pump. The arterial system has the pump, which is the heart. But in order for the blood to get back up to the heart at 10,000 feet, you may need to move your calves up and down in order to do that. Yeah, the compression socks did not work for me. I tried them and uh, it made things worse. When I took my socks off, you could see where my sock was because it compressed my leg, made that part of my leg smaller. Well, do you remember our member, David, who has that compression machine that he uses at home? He was overusing it because he was only supposed to use it intermittently. It is important for us to understand that the body wants homeostasis, balance. When we do something that sounds like a good thing too much, we throw it out of balance in the other direction. If you're going to get on a plane, you need to watch this video before you get on a plane. And it goes into the famous newscaster that actually died from deep vein thrombosis. And I think he was only in his 40s when he died. And Ron, can you share with everybody how old you are today? 76. Yep. 76 years old and you're still alive and kicking. How old were you when you had the DVT? 40 something. Exactly. You were fortunate that you did not die. This 40 something year old in the video that I showed you, he had medics telling him you need to get evaluated and he ignored them too. So hats off to your wife for saving your life. You owe her your life. Let's put it that way. She already knew that. <laughs> If anybody wants that video, you can either go to my YouTube channel, Goodbye Gut, or you can just pull it off of the chat right here at the side. On a few occasions, a pain, like a stabbing pain at the back of the eye. Stabbing pain to the back of the eye. First of all, there's no pain sensors on the back of the eye. Okay. And that means that that pain that you're feeling is coming from somewhere else where it's somewhere else, but it seems like it's the back of the eye. And this happens more for us females. The females have more hormonal shifts in our body. You guys have hormones, but your hormones are a lot more steady, which is why you guys don't have as many headaches as we women do. That pain, Ruben, that you felt, I felt it before. It felt like someone was taking a sharp needle through my head. 
in one area only. It didn't last for very long and it went away and I had no vision change. Would you agree that's what you felt? Yep. So here's what happened. Hormonal imbalance. You guys have hormonal imbalances, but you guys have less of a chance because we women, when we're having our periods, we have a hormonal imbalance every 28 days not a hormonal imbalance i shouldn't say that we have a hormonal shift and when i had those shooting pains was back when i was what i would call a sugar burner what do we teach you guys we need to have you a hybrid engine to burn sugar when necessary it means fight or flight but we want to be burning fat most of the time but back when i was having what reuben had with the stabbing pain I was in private practice and I remember it like it was yesterday because I was at Vons, the grocery store. But back then when I was in private practice, I was a sugar burner. We doctors don't get told about nutrition. I didn't know any better. That's why I was a sugar burner. And this is one of the reasons why I had the hormonal imbalance and why that shooting pain happened. So does that help Ruben? Yes. If you felt like you learned something from this video, give it a thumbs up so you won't miss any of my future videos. Or, better yet, subscribe to the channel. It's free.